cats. So I finally, finally have some time, maybe, <laughs> to film my book review of Melmoth the Wanderer. You guys, this is like my, this is my new, this is, this replaces the monk for me. This book is amazing. It's like the epitome of the gothic novel right here, okay? This is amazing. And it didn't even take me that long to get through. Like, I would read hundreds. It's, how long is it? Um, not quite as long as the Mysteries of Udolfo, I think that's what it was. Um, 607 pages long. Well, if you get the Penguin, uh, classics. Um, I love Penguin classics. They're one of my favorite publishers. Anyways, okay. So, this book, y'all, this book. Oh my gosh. Okay, I say it is the epitome of the gothic novel because it's, ugh, it's, it has everything and and more. It's mm, it's amazing. I love it. Also, a big plus for this book is the fact that it inspired authors like Poe and Baudelaire, which is like in Coleridge, which is like huge because they're some of the largest figures in Gothic literature. And the fact that this book inspired them says a lot about this book. And even okay, even like. There's, um, uh, there's, you can see, uh, instances in here that inspired, for example, Poe, um, there's, it's mentioned in here, I can't say exactly how and why and what, but the word nevermore does come up in a similar context, kind of, as it is used in The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe, and so I'm just like, oh my gosh, this is blowing my mind. Also, the fact that this book, hold up, let me find it. Okay, this book has music, y'all, okay? Like, he wrote music. This has music, you guys. So, you might think that the length of this book uh, gives this room, I guess, or makes it more likely for, um, I guess, passages or moments that are boring or too lengthy, if that makes sense. You know, how like you read a book and you have to like trudge through a part that you don't really care about or that's just boring or written in a boring way. That is not the case with this book, okay? I, you don't get that with this book. This, it's just so, it's, there's like so, there's too much that happens. There is not a dull moment in this book. Let me just say that. That's easier and short, sweet, and simple. Um, yeah, there isn't a dull moment in this book. There is just so much to this book. So it's so complex. It's it's one of those um, pieces that's a story within a story. So similar to the monk, it's told from different perspectives. However, it's done in a different way than in the monk. So it starts with the main character. Um, Melmoth. Oh, I need like a whiteboard or something to show you guys. He reads a manuscript that tells the story of a young man, I think in London. Um, yeah, in London. And then River back to him and you know, his life. Then a Spaniard gets involved. And from the Spaniard, you hear um, his story, right? So it's like Melmoth. And then he's listening to the Spaniard tell his own story, inside of which is another story. And inside that story, I think there's there's another story. Yep. And then like little other stories that are told. So it can, it might get confusing if it's hard, if you're a person for whom it's hard to like follow, I guess, things. Um, but I liked it and I could keep up with it. I could understand it. But if you think that might be difficult for you, then I'm sorry. You could probably just Google it if you get confused or lost, but it's amazing. And because I think because it does that, that's why it's able to involve every single aspect of the Gothic novel. And it's able to explore different avenues and scenarios and possibilities with it. If that makes sense. Also, okay, so you know how each um, gothic novel 
has a heroine who's like, who is super hyper pure, like stupid pure and like stupid moral and like self-righteous and just <laughs> unrealistically wholesome, I guess. And not, they don't, it's like they don't struggle as much as you feel like they should realistically with um, like with their flesh, like spirit versus flesh, passion, and the forbidden versus what is right, if any of this makes sense. That is not the case. Okay, well, kind of. So the heroine in this, um, in this book, it's, okay, I just need you guys to read it. Oops. Okay, <laughs> I'm trying not to get carried away too much with my feelings. Okay, so she, it's like, it's like the heroine is taken to another level. level. She is more complex to a degree. I did end up getting frustrated with her in the end. Um, I was like, okay, girl, you need to make up your mind and then stuff happens and I'm like you're an idiot you said one thing and you did another you're not a woman of your word which just completely negates everything anyways but she does it, it it's just like this intense love story that has so much more to it and is so much more complex than your average love story in a gothic novel if that makes sense because she it's like you know how the heroine falls in love with the hero, but then the antagonist usually is going after her and she hates him and she's like, no, I want my hero. It's a little more complex in this case because the hero and the antagonist are kind of, are pretty much kind of, it can be argued, the same person. I feel like this would make sense if I were talking to someone who read it, but Y'all just need to read this, okay? This, like, it's way better than the Italian, in my opinion. It, like, significant, like, far better than the Italian. Um, it's a little better than The Monk, if you have or have not read The Monk. Um, it's, so this, now this and The Woman in White are my favorite gothic novels now. <laughs> this is just... This, like, this just, this changed a lot. This, I love this book so much. Um, what else did I want to say? So, it's important to know, you can read it on the synopsis, so this isn't, like, a spoiler or anything. But, like, the Melmoth. So, you know how I talked about Melmoth earlier? That's the descendant of who I'm going to call the Melmoth, or Melmoth the Wanderer, as he's known. Um, he, so a long time ago, for whatever reason, we don't know, which is unfortunate, which I wish was explained, but it wasn't, so I'm just gonna have to deal with it. Anyways, he uh, basically sold his soul to the devil for immortality, and um, he just spends the rest of his life, life on Earth, um, trying to find souls to take his place basically to trade places with him and the way he does that is he um approaches the individual at their most dire time i guess like the they're like at rock bottom the lowest of lows like it's either like they're like they would rather kill themselves or something like that. Like the situation, he approaches the individual in their most difficult situation. It's it, it gets intense. Like there are scenarios in here that are just crazy. And um, so it's, that's, that's how intense the temptation is. And he is called sometimes the tempter. But everyone says no, with the exception, I think, of one individual, the one in London. I can't remember. I think so. It was towards the beginning, so I don't entirely remember. Anyways, um, but...
But every person, with the exception of that one, I think, said no. And it mentioned in the novel how everyone in the world would say no in their right mind. Like, no one would ever give up their soul. And I beg to differ. At least nowadays, I think people would totally sell their souls at the drop of a dime. Especially in situations such as these. People have done terrible things um and you see it and i could only imagine what someone would do to save themselves um or to get themselves out of these situations i think nowadays you would totally find people who would be more than willing um to basically sell their soul um in order to get out of that situation Uh, so, like, like, 20 out of 10 for this, man. This book is amazing. If you haven't, if you haven't read it, please, please just read this. If there is any book out of all that I have reviewed for you guys, even the ones that I deleted, that I need you guys to read, it would be this. Um, oh, okay, I misspoke. It wasn't... Coleridge that was inspired by him. It was Wilde. Oscar Wilde. That's who I meant. I'm sorry. I confused them. Um, but you guys just need to read this. Like, I, I don't, I, like, yeah. This, the, and the way it's written is just so, like, rich and passionate and there are things that are taken to a whole new level, like way above, like the monk, maybe with the exception of incest, but still, the, and he doesn't dwell as long as, or yeah, he doesn't dwell as long as Radcliffe does in ter on describing scenes and nature and all of that. I mean, he does it because this is. I mean, after all, a piece of gothic literature. However, he doesn't drag it on like Radcliffe does, which I certainly appreciate. And you know how I mentioned in my last book review how Radcliffe would hold back in terms of indulging passions and um, and letting things happen or even just like describing thoughts? That is not the case with this book. Everything is all white out in the open. Like, it is... It's amazing. There is so much in this book. Um, there's so much social commentary, theological commentary. It's, oh, gosh, it's amazing. And, and um, it does, it involves things such as the Inquisition, even insane asylums, and um, even foreign countries, and child sacrifice, and and um what else insanity and familial betrayal and uh, it's and even it does have that supernatural paranormal touch to it as well um you guys just have to read this that's that's all i'm gonna say because this video is long enough just just read it just read it. just promise me you will read it put it on your bucket list okay <laughs> Anyways, um, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you liked it. I hope it was helpful in that it convinced you one way or another to or not to read the book. Um, so yeah, that's all I got. I guess I will see you in my next video. <laughs> Bye.